Tips Welcome for... back to Hello Nigeria. Our second guest is here with us in the studio. And still, in the spirit of 16 days of activism, we have one who has actually survived sexual violence and has gone ahead to take her pain to make it her purpose by creating a safe space for victims of sexual abuse. Now, she runs Drill Hive. That is that safe space that we've spoken about. And of course, she'll get to tell us about it. She's a lawyer, she's married, and her name is Olua Toyin Palaye. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me, Olive. And um, I must say, well done for what you do. Thank you've you. Been through pain and you've decided to make this pain your sort of comfort to other people who are going through this. Yes. So let's let's go back to the very beginning when all this started. Let's talk about Toyin before the abuse. Who was Toyin before the abuse? And what was her dream? What were her dreams? Um, Tony, before the abuse, was um, the small village girl who turned the city girl. You know, um, her father brought her to the city to live with his sister. And she was, of course, very excited to become a city girl. And she had this dream of just being great. I remember as in primary school, I had, I, carried, I had first position all through primary school. So I was always excited to be up there in front there going for competitions, representing my school, being on TV as a little girl. You know, he, I really wanted to be great. I really wanted to be somebody. Do you still have those dreams? Yes. Are you living them? Oh, well, I'm trying to. Because at, at some point, I, I felt I wasn't. I felt I was losing myself. I felt all of those dreams, all of those aspirations were kind of being swept. You know, I kept going in and out of depression. I kept battling stuff, and I just felt that life was being unfair to me, you know. So I'm guessing the depression started when the sexual abuse started? Not at all, really, because depression started, um, I think, a few years ago, you know, when, like, you, like I say, when you feel like you're not actualizing your dreams, you're not there, where you're not where you actually thought you would be at a certain age, a certain point in time in your life. That was when the depression started. But for the abuse, it started when I was 10. OK, so lead us through exactly what happened and you know, okay. how it happened. Well, at 10, I was raped. I was raped by a neighbor's son. And like I said, it was just barely a couple of years after I came into Lagos or into the city. And I didn't know it was called rape. I didn't know what was called virginity. So when I was raped, I just knew I was screaming. I was alone in the house and I was screaming. And then this neighbor came in and spanked the boy and cleaned me up and told me not to tell anyone. So when the sexual abuse started when I was 12, I was no longer a virgin. So when he started to molest me, the first thing he said was, something is missing in your body. How did it go? And I said, I don't know. He said, who has been touching you? I said, you, because he comes every night. So it was like, no, it's not me. Somebody has taken something, and I need to help you put it back. And when I'm doing it, you must not tell anyone. And I was scared. Because we grew up in a home where um, it was like a military setting, you know, like a dictatorial setting. He was lord and master. We had no say. We were really scared of him. We were always afraid of him. Who is he? My aunt's husband, actually. OK. Yeah. So for me, um, having grown up in that environment, when the first night it happened, I can remember that picture vividly well, um, a lot of things had happened before then. So I had been moved to the living room. I was asked to sleep in the living room. So the living room was my bedroom. So he would come at about 12 a.m. at night. So the first time I was conscious, because I used to be a deep sleeper, so I, I probably wouldn't know if it had even started before then. But that night, I remember, I woke up and I saw my, him holding my wrapper. I was like, Daddy, please, I'm sorry, what have I done? Because I thought I had offended him and he wanted to punish me. And he said, I should shut up. That's him. Um, he told me that he needed to fix something and I must obey him. And if I tell anyone, I'll go back to the village. Do you want to go back to the village? Of course I said no. I was a brilliant student in school. I was excited about going to school. so. I said, I don't want to go back to the village. And how long did this abuse last for? Seven years. In all this time, did you speak to anybody about it? I remember when I was about 15, I confided in my childhood best friend then, and then I had this 
male friend around the Hera who used to give me books to read. And of course, they said, tell mommy. And I said, no, I can't tell her. She won't believe me. She won't even listen to me. Those were the only two people I ever told about it, but they didn't even know the gravity of it. Because when it started, he never had penetrative sex with me for years. It was oral. So all kinds of oral things you can imagine in your head, he did to me. I could remember vividly well the first time he was sexual. It was in 2000 when the bomb blast happened and mommy was out of the house. We were all worried sick that, oh, we hope she's not been trapped. Then phone, um, you know, the GSM had not become popular. And everybody, the neighbors came around and everybody was scared. And then they all left and it was just me and him in the house. And he took me into his room and had a field day. Did you ever tell mommy, your auntie? I could not. Why? Like I said, this was, we lived in a patriarchal environment. This was a home where daddy was lord and master. And mommy practically worshipped the ground on which he walked on. She would never raise her voice at him. Whatever he said was law. So she herself had her own issues. There was no child in the marriage and all of that. So that was there. The only time I tried to mention it to her, when I started to menstruate, and, I, and she kept saying, once a guy touches you, just come home crying. It means you are pregnant, you know, that kind of. And I said, mommy, but daddy is always touching me. She said, no, not that kind of touch. Daddy is your daddy, he will always touch you. I mean, from outside, so I couldn't. So you never mentioned it to her? No, she found out herself eventually. How did she find out? Well, I guess somehow God just felt it was time for me to be free. Because in between that twice I had attempted suicide. The first time I was in the kitchen, I had actually picked up the knife. I just wanted to hand it. It was mommy that walked in and I dropped the knife. The second time I you know, went to the first aid box and I took all the drugs you have there, the paracetamol. I thought that once I take them, and I used to watch it in the movies and you just take drugs and you die. So I took all of that and I thought I wouldn't wake up the next morning, but I did. So the night she would fi find out, she said, before that time, I had become aware, I was growing, I was 16, 17, going on 18, and I had started reading books. I knew he was called incest. Of course, I knew he was wrong, and I hated this person. So that particular night, I pulled a knife. When he would come between two, 12 and 2 a.m., there was, there was, I stopped sleeping, you know? So when he came that night, I pulled out the knife, and I said, it's either I eat you with this knife or I harm myself. And he said, no, 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 who have you been talking to? Who did you tell about this? I told you it would take time for me to get you back into what has been taken away from you. And I said, I've not told anybody, but I know what you're doing to me is wrong, and one of us will have to die. So he pleaded with me that night and left. Two, three, four months, he didn't come, you know, at the usual top. So the night, so I had started to begin to sleep again to be able to sleep at, because it, my senses became aware at a lot, once it's 12 a.m., I'm up. So that night, according to mom, because I didn't know, I was sleeping. She said she came in to see, check the time. And then she found him standing in between my legs with his trousers halfway down. She ran back. Next morning, we all acted like nothing happened. Remember, I was asleep, I didn't know. So it was my SS2 going to SS3, it was long-term holiday. So she called me into her room, locked the door and gave me the Bible and said, you know, that was the first time I took the oath of <laughs> whatever you're going to say is the truth and nothing but the truth. And then she asked me, what is going on between you and daddy? I said, nothing. Immediately I became scared. I thought he had turned the story around after I threatened him with a knife. She asked the second time, and then the third time, she said, what has daddy be, been doing to you? And then I busted into tears and I told her. And what did she do about this? She screamed. She ran out of the house. She ran to a neighbor's place. She told the neighbor. And the neighbor told her, don't tell anyone. And she ended up not telling daddy? She went to the grave with that secret. Have you ever confronted him? No. Do you ever think you'll confront him? I mean, you're married now, you're years after, and you still feel this pain. Or don't you? 
As a matter of fact, the day I realized I had not healed was just a couple of months ago. My kid sister lives with me, and that particular day, she was just in the living room, you know, just chatting with my husband. I was in the kitchen, and I became agitated. I became uncomfortable, and I was scared. I just shouted, what are you doing there? Come back here, come to the kitchen. Whenever I'm in the kitchen, you stay here with me. It was at night I realized it was because I felt, even though I trust my husband 150%, this was psychological. And um, confronting him will be hard. He's old now, he's, he's a lot older, he's in his 70s. And I managed to try to look like I still had a relationship with him because my aunt was still alive. She was hypertensive and she always just call him, call him, talk to him. But immediately she passed, I severed that relationship. I don't talk to him, I don't call him. And uh, confronting with him is really tough actually because we both know we hate each other. Because after the abuse, after my aunt found out, for the first time in her marriage and the last time, she spoke up, she said, Toyi will never sleep in the living room again. She'll be sleeping with me in the room. She's a lady. She needs protection. He, he, he almost broke her marriage, Daddy, but she actually stood up for me that night. And that was how my sleeping in the living room ended. Toyi, you are such a strong woman with a powerful story. And you've gone ahead to start your own foundation, Joha. Yeah. Tell us quickly about that. Well, Jewel's initiative, like I said, was actually born out of my pain, where I said we need to create a safe space for victims of sexual abuse. Because we've come to realize that most of the problem with victims of sexual abuse is that even after the abuse, they remain in the place of abuse. And seeing the abuser on a daily basis is damaging psychologically. So we have a long-term goal of actually having physical buildings, if possible, across the states in Nigeria, or at least the geopolitical zones, where we can rescue victims of sexual abuse and take them through mentoring, therapy, vocation, and the likes and then they can heal and before they get absorbed back into society. I think this, that's really brilliant and fantastic. Thank we just you. spoke with the founder of Warif, and you know that is something similar that they're doing as well. We can never have enough of these conversations and enough of these instances. Yes. So as someone who has survived, conquered you know, sexual abuse, what would you say to somebody who is in that current situation where you are in a few seconds? What would you say to someone who has been abused and dealing with the pain? I would say that um, when mine happened, we didn't have this much social awareness, um, education, um, you know, social, uh, social media pages. Now there's a whole lot of that. There are help centers. So please speak out if you can. If you can scribble a message to somebody or talk to somebody, please do so. You know, I think that's just the best form of um, so basically, awareness talk now. To somebody. Just talk to somebody about right. it and somebody will help you escalate it. Thank you so much, Tony, for sharing Thank your you story with us. How can me. they follow you real quick? Jewels and this call Hive is our official Instagram handle. All right. And on Facebook, Jewels Hive. All right. Thank Shady. you so much for joining us. To enjoy more of this, our Ugonke videos when you just watch, press this button to subscribe on top of our YouTube page. You go love her.